What they're doing is creating a virtual antenna in the sky that radiates extremely low frequency signals that travel worldwide and can be heard in the deepest depths of our oceans. This virtual antenna is called a ionospheric Alvin resonator, IAR. The ionospheric Alvin resonator is using the ionosphere as an antenna. So it's it could be considered a geophysical weapon. It's been that's a term that has been used and thrown around quite a bit. So what happens? In addition to creating an I, IAR, heating the ionosphere with high frequency radio waves will pr produce alpha waves and magnetosonic waves, MS waves. Now, what are those? These are geomagnetic pulsations. Standing oscillations of the geomagnetic field lines which behave as strings with ends fixed in the ionosphere. So when you move it up here, a standing wave can occur along these magnetic field lines and compressive magnetohydrodynamic waves, magnetosonic waves, come straight through. They're also known as PC1, okay? So periods, 0.2 to 5. And and it says in here frequency in megahertz, 200 to 5,000 um, megahertz. PC1 triggered emissions, and this right here, you're going to see spectrum for harp ULF start experiment, ambient noise. There's the Schumann resonance right there. And then 60 hertz, you can see now harp has been turned on. Do you see the difference? This was our ionosphere, naturally occurring, nothing happening. Ambient noise, they call it. Now they turn harp on. Spectrum at harp ULF start noise increase by 10 to 20 decibels between 0.7 to 10 hertz. And our Schumann resonance, our heartbeat of our planet, has now disappeared. It's gone. And there's now a spike at 60 hertz. So messing with the heartbeat of our planet and, and changing our background no electrical noise by 10 to 20 decibels, probably not a good thing probably not a good thing but nobody talks about this realistically so in a paper called virtual ulf elf vlf ionospheric antenna uh, resolving critical radiation belt and geospace issues now so you say to yourself why would they want to be doing this well um some of it's just experimentation let's see what happens poke it see what happens let's let's see what comes out other parts are, you know, they say they're going to try to protect satellites with this radiation belt remediation. But so why are they at different levels? You know, I was saying, why are they along the, the, the equator? I'm just, I'm seeing them all at the North Pole and these others are at the equator. Well, it turns out there's these L shells. And as you can see here, there's a shell. And if you fire a shot off into space and you're up here at the North Pole, it's going to travel a long distance and come down and land at the South Pole. If you're Sura right here, which is an L shell 2.5, it's gonna fire and land at a shorter distance. It's gonna land closer to the equator. So it, what we're seeing here is there's a link between how the, tra the radiation tra transmits and where it lands. So again, harp up here, heated region, injected waves go into space, they come all the way out here, and they land down here at the conjugate point. Then some of it bounces off and, you know, aggravates the heads of people all in this region, then bounces back into space. Now, once it makes it all the way back to harp, that's called a hop. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, they have a thing out here in the middle of the ocean called the harp buoy, and it's part of the one hop um, experiment. And you can see it right here, harp buoy. And it's a VLF buoy. So basically, the place where Harp lands in the ocean, because it has a very specific spot that when they fire it in the sky, that's where it's going to land. They put a uh, receiver out there to listen for it. Okay? And that conjugate point is down here, right off the coast of Australia. So there you go. Fires all the way around, lands all the way down here. Pretty neat. Okay? Um, and they all have a conjugate point that their transmissions land on. So they want to, you know, move it around. Maybe putting it at the equator would give them a different landing spot is what I originally thought. But it turns out it's much simpler. 
there are only two ways to heat the ionosphere and do elf generation and modify it the way they're talking about and i'm going to go through those right now and we're going to conclude this video polar electro jet heating this is the way all of these at the north pole work they heat the it, i'll just read it high latitude ionospheric heaters can use the electro jet a naturally occurring electrical current in the de region this is 70 to 90 kilometers so right about here it, of the ionosphere as both an amplifier and virtual antenna now the electro jet is something special and it's right here see this ring over here on Climate Viewer 3D, I'm actually got it up right now to prove my point. So this is your electrojet, and let's go over here to Harp. This is Harp. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. So the reason why they don't need Harp anymore is because they're not even going to do polar electrojet heating anymore. They found a better way, and the reason they found a better way. The, the reason why these are at the, at the equator now is because of that better way. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So this is the electrojet. And HARP, when it shoots its electricity directly into the electrojet, um, can produce uh, very low frequency waves. Um, and right here is a chart from uh, Dennis Papadopoulos, you know, explaining all this. This is how I just recently found this out. He had a great... Um, series of slides that I read through and um, turns out natural current flow natural currents flow in the auroral and equatorial ionospheric ionosphere at 80 to 100 kilometers the high frequency signal heats the and thereby changes the local conductivity of the ionosphere the electrojet current is then caused to vary at the same elf VLF rate propagating elf wave signals are radiating by this virtual radiated by this virtual antenna so they pump electricity into this it gives off its own radio signal as a result and that's why we've been hearing these strange apocalyptic sounds all over the world of electrical sounds in the sky all of which seem to occur in northern latitudes Okay, this video is going to explain uh, where the chemtrail spider webs are coming from, uh, what they do to the environment, and why they're actually being created. A uh, French scientist and some testing I've done has shown that they are actually phthalates, which is a molecule that looks like this. These are all phthalates. You notice that they have a, uh, a benzene ring at one end, then a couple of long carbon chains with some oxygens off the side and methyl groups. So it's when these side chains get very long they're able to polymerize and actually create a false spider web. So why is this program in existence? Phthalates block ultraviolet better than any other organic acid that is uh, normally floating around in the atmosphere. How are they doing it? The phthalates are formed in the cooling jet exhaust due to a vanadium catalyst in the jet fuel. Here's an absorption spectra of selected organic acids, uh, namely benzoic, phthalic, and oxalic acid. 
Again, here's our harmful ultraviolet B area. Phthalic acid absorbs more ultraviolet at one-third of the concentration of oxalic acid. Phthalic acid is the best choice for an airborne trace chemical which absorbs harmful ultraviolet. <clears throat> This classified program is being done to create a small amount of extra ultraviolet protection. Here in this, uh, here's 250 nanometer germicidal ultraviolet, which breaks uh, DNA in seconds, and up to uh, ultraviolet A, which starts about 315. So it's this small hump in this dashed line right here that is the whole reason for this program. And it absorbance is maximum about 0.5 here. So not much protection is the reason for this whole program. To repeat for clarity, phthalic acid is the best choice for an airborne trace chemical to deliberately absorb harmful ultraviolet. What does this chemical reaction look like inside the jet's jet engine and in the exhaust stream of the jet? First we start with jet fuel, which contains naphthalene and a vanadium impurity. As it burns, the vanadium is turned into vanadium pentoxide, which is the catalyst. It's added to the naphthalene and oxygen in the air and in the fuel, producing phthalic anhydride. And this is well known, a very common uh, industrial chemical reaction. You add that to water or steam in the jet exhaust and the hydrolysis produces phthalic acid and other phthalates and some benzene ring compounds. With time and ultraviolet ionization, hydrogen bonding causes polymerization into long phthalate fibers which resemble cobwebs and then fall to the earth. So to summarize, Jet fuels high in vanadium plus modifications to the jet engine, the jet engine software, the diffuser, etc. equals a covert sunscreen screen program with also toxic chemicals falling from the sky disguised as spider webs. So it's my belief, and I have a great deal of experience to back this up, the secret ionospheric heaters are blasting holes in the ozone layer every day. As a cover for the ionospheric heater secret weather warfare, the chemtrail aerosols are poisoning the planet with phthalates to hide the excess ultraviolet levels. The secrecy behind the sunscreen program is an indication of how desperate the global situation is as long as the ionospheric heaters continue to run. Military commanders all over the world must stop the operation of all ionospheric heaters and declassify the chemtrail aerosol program so it can be evaluated by the best scientists.